Um, jumping into today, this past week, my wife, Rebecca, and my 19-year-old son, Leo, they went to New York together, and it was kind of like a, um, it was like a senior, kind of a late senior trip for Leo, and, uh, and they went to some plays and did some shows, and they got to see all kinds of stuff and had some, some really had an incredible time. I mean, I, I got to follow along with the pictures and what all was going on. I'm telling you, they had a blast, and then they they get back on the subway in order to head back to the airport on their way back home, and they met somebody. They met this guy. Now, I've, I intentionally, you know, left his face off of this just out of respect, but, but this was the guy that they met, and they ended up in a car with him. Um, they didn't get a name necessarily, or at least not that I heard, but my wife ended up, um, you know, kind of grabbing this picture because uh, it, it was one of those moments, you know, and there's a lot of people in New York who are homeless. Matter of fact, I, I looked it up, there's 70 to 80,000 people who are homeless in New York, and yet this was one of them. It was very clear he was homeless, he had nothing. I mean, this is what he had been in for a long time, apparently. It was, you know, his shoes were essentially the, those little booties that you put around a cast, you know, so that you can walk and, you know, had on just filthy clothes and and. And it, and it was one of those moments, I'm sure you've had, you know, little scenarios like this when, when you kind of come across this, especially if you've been in a big city or, you know, uh, you, you've come across homelessness like that or, or just any kind of scenario where your heart breaks a little bit. And it's like, oh, my goodness, this is awful. You know, I want to do something. I want to help. And so, and, and you know, of course, it's, a lot of us are thinking, yeah, I mean, what, what difference does that really make? And yet, in that moment, it was like, no, we're doing something. And so they ended up taking a trash bag and put a bunch of Leo's um, clothes in it for him and even some of his tennis shoes and left it with him. And, and, and of course, when, when we're faced with a scenario like this, when, when a situation kind of comes up like this, and even when our heart kind of breaks for that, and we, we're, Oftentimes, what also that, that internal battle starts to happen in our minds, and we start thinking, well, I mean, does this really even make a difference? You ever felt that way? I mean, it's just like, I mean, what difference does it really make? I mean, we've run into this guy. I mean, did I, you know, I, maybe I'll give him some clothes or buy him a sandwich or whatever, but does that really make a difference? I mean, there's, there's 80,000 people who are homeless in this city, and I can't, I mean, good gracious, like, what difference does this make? I mean, does it really, like, does this really even help? It, it, should I even worry about doing this? And we, and we get overwhelmed. It's so easy. We hear statistics about the homelessness, not just in a city, but all around the world, and orphans, and the, the millions of orphans worldwide who are considered unadoptable because they're aging out or because they've got some sort of disease or mental illness, and nobody wants to adopt them. And you get overwhelmed. It's like, oh my goodness, like I don't even want to think about that. Or, you know, just the number of foster kids just in our state alone. It's overwhelming. It's staggering. And we, we hear statistics like that, and we read things of addiction and divorce and people who are struggling with all sorts of things. And just all of the issues, and you can't even plead ignorant in today's world because, like, it's the information age, you know? And so, like, even if you turn the TV off and everything, like, somebody knows something and they're going to let you know it. And it's like, oh, goodness, and it gets overwhelming. And oftentimes, we, we tend to respond in a couple of different ways. One of the ways is we tend to just disengage altogether. Isn't that true? And some of us just respond that way. It's like, ah, I don't know what to do. There's just too much around me. I'm just, I, I, don't, even, I don't even know how to think about this. Like, what difference does it make? I can't really make a difference. And so I'm just going to disengage. I'm just not going to do anything. Somebody else is probably going to take care of that. Somebody else is going to do that. And we just, we would rather, and when we disengage, we tend to grow a little numb. Isn't that true? Numb to the numbers. We just, you know, it's, we just distance ourselves and it's like, it's just easier. I know I can't make a difference anyway, and so I'm just not going to do anything. Now, some of us respond that way, but then there's others of us who are more like my wife and go like in the, the far opposite direction. And they have, and some of you maybe have a tendency like her to over-engage. Now, I know that is surprising for those, who you know, for those of you who know my wife, that she would ever over-engage in something and that she's a little hyperactive. And that she like always is keeping like a million things going, kind of juggling all sorts of plates all at the same time. I mean, she just knows like this is kind of who she is. And, and those of you who know her well know that. But the thing is, she just, I, I, one of the things that I love about her is like she's not talk. Like she's not like, well, you know, maybe we ought to do something or we ought to just consider. Like she just does. And then she asks questions later, you know. Anybody like that? 
It's just like, I'm just going to, like, I'm presented with an opportunity, and here's something that happened, and I'm just going to jump in. I'm not going to ask questions. I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to serve. I'm going to do something. And the thing is, and she knows this too, is that we, those of us who overengage a little bit tend to get overwhelmed by trying to do too much. And then even still feeling like you're not making a big enough difference. And then what? You know, it's like, well, goodness, there's got to be, you know, some in between. And yet we find ourselves kind of pulled in both directions. We either just disengage or we overengage. And it's like, is there a way to meet in the middle somewhere? And, and this is what we all know. This is what we all know. You can't solve the world's problems. We all know this. But you can't ignore them either. You can't solve all the world's problems. You can't fix every issue, but you also can't ignore them either. Why? Because we're Christians. Like I'm a Jesus follower, so I can't just like turn a blind eye. I can't. I know I can't fix it all. I I can't really help this guy, can I? I mean, does some you know some extra clothing? Like I, it's not like I can really get this guy you know into a home and you know have a job and blah blah blah. Like you know, so maybe I can't make a difference, but I can't just. I can't ignore it. And so there is a tension that we all face when it comes to this. And so what do we do with that? What do, and that's really what I want to address today. What do you do with the tension between doing too much and doing nothing at all? Have you ever considered that? Because some of you, and let me just be real clear, like this is not a guilt trip for anybody, okay? This is just some awareness. This is a reminder that there actually is a way forward. And there's a principle that I want to teach. It's super simple to talk about, but I want to flesh it out through Scripture because there is a way to manage this tension. You can't resolve it. There's always going to be times where you feel like you can't do enough or where you get overwhelmed or where you just kind of want to back off and do nothing. And, and we're constantly going to be tugging back and forth, but, but there is a way forward. There's a way to think about this. Thankfully, um, this is something that Christians have been dealing with since Christian became a thing, like 2,000 years ago when all this started. Why? Because there's always been great need. Isn't that true? I mean, the church has always been dealing with all of the orphans that are out there. There's always been a bunch of people who are, who are in need and need extra care. You know, the widows and the orphans and those who are, you know, homeless, the homelessness and those who have great need and, and are, are too hungry or they're thirsty or they... They don't have enough clothing, they don't have shelter, they have addictions, they have sickness or illness, and, and there's marginalized people, and there's always been that within the church. And so the question has always been, not that should we do something, we know we should, but it's like, but, do, but, but how do I figure out what to do, and for whom? Because I can't do it all, I can't fix it all, but I know I need to do something. The Apostle Paul addressed this very issue. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 6, but, but here's what you need to know. Galatians was, was a letter that Paul wrote in order to encourage Christians in some of these ways, especially when you get to chapters 5 and 6. He's, he's just kind of giving this broad perspective on what it looks like to live as people who are filled with God's Spirit. Like Galatians chapter 5 and 6, I mean, that's really what he's saying. Here's how to live as a result of God's Spirit living within you. If, you, if you're a Jesus follower, then God's Spirit lives within you, and here's the fruit of that. Matter of fact, the end of chapter 5, he gives the fruit of the Spirit. He talks about it. Not fruits. It's like singular fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Like all of those things really is like one thing, and it is produced by the Spirit living within us. Then we get to chapter 6, and he kind of talks, fleshes out this, this basic principle um, this spiritual principle of sowing and reaping. You've probably heard this before. You don't have to be a Christian to know that oftentimes this is true. Now, a lot of, a lot of times if you're not in church world, you call it like karma, you know? I mean, it's like, oh, well, that's karma for you, you know? But, but in, in church world, in the realm of spirituality, we call that the, the principle of sowing and reaping, that, that if you sow evil, you reap evil evil. You sow good, you reap good. I mean, it's just this basic idea. Well, then in chapter 6, verse 7, he lays out this principle, okay? He describes this principle and then says, now here's what to do in response to that, okay? So he gives us his principle. He says, a man, and you know this, a man reaps what he sows. 
Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. If, you, if you're a parent and you have kids, you've told your kids this, but not in so many words. You've said something like this, and well, you're just getting what you deserve. Well, I mean, this is the path that you've been on. Well, I mean, you, you did it to them, so it's probably going to happen to you. I mean, these are the kind of things that we say. Well, you know, you've just, you know, you've gotten what's coming to you. You did this, and so this is the consequence. And that's what we mean. This is really what we mean. Spiritually speaking, that's, that's just reaping what you sow. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, though, that's living within them, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. There is an eternal consequence to, what, to, to how we sow within our lives. And if you want to reap eternal life, then there, there is a part of the process is, well, then are you sowing to please and to nurture the spirit that's living within you? Are you living as if God's spirit lives within you? And so then he says, so since that's the case, and you probably know that, Christians, since, that's, since that is the case, Paul gets real practical like he's you know we get this spiritual principle but then he says but here's kind of the uh the in this world kind of practical application of this so let us not become weary in doing good that's the first thing he says i mean since you reap what you sow and sowing good reaps what is good then then don't become weary in doing good that makes sense but but Understand this, Paul, I mean, some of you, like, this was worth the price of admission today because you hear this and it's like, oh, so Paul understands that sometimes I get tired of doing good. Anybody with me? Like, no, can I say that in church? It's like, come on. Like, I mean, what is good? Let's be real honest. Sometimes we get tired of serving, of giving, of being generous. We get tired of of going to church of some of those disciplines and those practices why because some of them are difficult being in a small group and you know turning the other cheek and forgiving people and doing good like i sometimes i just i grow weary like i know that i should but i'm just kind of tired can i be bad for a day anybody ever like it's like i'll you know i'll get forgiveness tomorrow I mean, seriously, my uncle, my uncle, my dad's brother, I don't know that I've ever shared this with anybody on, on a stage before, but he used to tell me, because I, I would travel around with him, he was a recruiter for Georgia Southern University, and like he, he was assistant head football coach, and so we'd travel around together when I was a kid, and it was awesome, you know, we'd have a pass, and we'd get to go to high school football games and stand on the sidelines, and it was awesome, and I remember he would tell me, he would say, you know, the great thing, you know, uh, uh, about forgiveness is that, you know, I can fill up my bucket during the week, and then I, you know, pour it out in confession, you know, on the weekends. Isn't that great? And I was like, that just doesn't seem right, you know? It's like, but, you know, I mean, that was kind of the, the mentality. It's like, I mean, I, I get to ask forgiveness anyway, so I can just kind of do what I want the rest of the time. You know, and that was probably a little tongue-in-cheek, but, man, I was like, Okay, <laughs> I mean, that, that just sounds interesting, but we all kind of deal with that, don't we? We just grow, grow a little weary in doing good, just get a little, I'm tired. And we knew that when we started this church, that people would get tired of serving, and yet we're a church that's portable, and we have to set up and tear down every week, and we need people that are willing to just continue to sweat, and you know, blood, sweat, and tears every single week. It's a grind. And, and over and over, even though we've kept that vision in front, we've tried to remind people of why it's so important, of the what that we do and, you know, setting up a parking lot, that's a hard sell. But, but when we remind people of why, then we, you know, oh, yeah, I remember. But even still, people just get tired, tired of serving. I'm just all served out, you know, pastor, all served out. I just can't do this anymore. And, that, and I get that. Paul's saying, don't, don't. Why? Because the sowing and reaping principle applies. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest. If you don't give up, don't, don't give up. I know you want to quit. I know you're tempted. I know you get tired and weary, and it's like, oh, I'm exhausted, and can I just do what I want? And it's like, but I'm telling you, at the proper time, whether it's when you think it will happen or when God's plan, planning on it to happen, at, at that point, you will absolutely reap a harvest in your own life, in the lives of other people, maybe in 
the realm of eternity, you will reap a harvest if you just don't give up. And so what do we do about that? If we, how, do we, how do we apply this then? Where's the principle? And we get this subtle principle here, and I love this. He, he makes a little statement that it's easy to kind of read right over if we're not paying attention, but it, it's a qualifying statement. It makes all the difference in what we're about to read. He says, therefore, 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 since if you just stick with it, you will reap a harvest when the time is right if you just don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, that's so important, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers, especially the people who you're doing life with, the people who believe what you believe. I mean, he's just saying, especially those people, those men and women, the people in your church, the people you're in small group with, I mean, it, like, at least meet those needs, like, especially, they're right in your face, like, they're with you all the time, and so, do good, whatever that means, in every way, do good, but notice he puts, as we have, oper- this is a qualifying statement, this is so important, and notice this, in the, in the, the Greek word that's translated opportunity, in other places in, in the New Testament, it's translated time, those are kind of interchangeable, and so really he's saying, he recognizes that it's only as we have time and as we have opportunity. He doesn't say, therefore, let us do good to all people, all the time, everywhere, for the rest of your life, with every waking hour. He doesn't say that. Paul recognizes that our time and our opportunities and our resources are limited. You follow me? That's why this is subtle, but it's there. As we have opportunity, in other words, as God presents something to you, as you feel that gentle nudge, in that moment where you're on the subway and you see that, that guy and your heart breaks a little bit, you have an opportunity. As you have opportunity, you might not can, can do this for everybody, but in that moment, do good. And I mean, it doesn't matter who they are, to everybody, to all people, especially those who are part of the family of believers. Because you see, we all know, we all know, we cannot help every person and we can't solve every problem. Isn't that true? Like we all know that. But, but we can do something for someone. We can do something for someone. That's what Paul, I I think, like if we had to put it in our terms, that's one of the ways Paul might say it. Saying, I recognize that you don't have all the time in the world. You don't have all the resources in the world. Certain things are not, you know, breaking your heart. They're not, you know, it's not kind of your area, like a passion point for you. This isn't something you're already involved in. And so I I recognize that. And so you're not, not every single individual is going to be able to help every person everywhere and fix every problem. But that doesn't mean that you can't do something for someone somewhere at some time. Okay? Again, I think we know this. But here's the underlying principle that I think is is so helpful and I remember when I heard this the first time and, and this was something that was actually taught to me but it was a little bit I remember getting a little offended it's like okay that's cute and that's easy to remember but I'm not sure is that right but here's what I think Paul might say in kind of a, a way that we might you know remember it and understand and this is what I heard a long time ago do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. I remember the first time I read that, I heard that, I was like, okay, again, that sounds good, but um, you know what I thought? Well, that's just not fair. Anybody? I can't do that. I mean, I mean, I, I like reverted back to childhood and I remembered my teacher, you know, and me asking my teacher, can I, I got a, I got a TT, can I go to the bathroom? <laughs> Can I go to the bathroom? Like elementary school. And what would my teacher say? Because they probably said it to you too. Matter of fact, some of you teachers, and you probably said this, okay? And, and it's like, no, I'm sorry. I can't let you go to the bathroom because if I let you go to the bathroom, then I got to let everybody go to the bathroom. And I literally remember thinking as a young person, I remember thinking, no, you don't. That's not true. You could. Just let me go to the bathroom. You have that authority. 
You do not have to let everybody go to the bathroom if you let me go to the bathroom. That doesn't make sense. And, and I remember thinking, you know, as, as a kid, and if you're a parent and you have young, young kids, or, you know, you may remember something like this, saying something like this, but as our kids are getting older, what is it that our parents said to us that we say to our kids as they're getting older? Well, life isn't fair. I'm sorry, life isn't fair. Well, that's not fair. Life isn't fair. We say that. And then we get to be adults, and we try to make everything fair. There's something in us that thinks, no, I can't do that for them, because then I'd have to do it for everybody. I can't give you a cookie, because then I'll have to give the whole class a cookie. You know, I mean, it was those kind of things. I'm like, that's just not true. Like, you don't have to try to be fair. Matter of fact, nobody can actually make anything feel completely fair all the time. Like, there's no way to actually do it. And so you know what that actually means. It means if we're trying to make things fair, we'll just not do anything for anybody. That's the truth. Because you can't make everything fair. Instead, what if we applied something like this, and this is why I love this, because I cannot, I, now I can't shake this phrase, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. I apply this in all kinds of scenarios in my life. Not just spiritually speaking, but in, in everything, in the way that we give, in the way that we serve, and in what I do for my kids. And it's a battle even in our own home sometimes, because guess what? We have twin 10 and a half year old boys. When you have twins, you feel like you've got to do for one what you do for the other. And it's just not the case. It's like, well, that's just not fair. It's like, no, but life isn't fair, buddy. And it's like, but, but then I try to be fair. Well, I got him one, so I got to get you one. I got her ice cream, so I guess you got to have ice cream. It's just like, no, you could do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Now here, what do you do then? Like, if that's the cute statement, and we can all remember this, what are the handles? Like, how can we actually, and, and so there's three things that actually will help us. I think this is super helpful. This is always, I'm telling you, this has helped me over the years in, in a lot of different scenarios. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone, but what are the handles that help me apply that in, in a situation? Like, how do I really discern when something, when I feel kind of, you know, I feel kind of bothered by something. Something kind of moves me. Something presents itself to me. Something kind of bumps into me, and I recognize a scenario or a situation or a person or an organization. Like, what do I do? How do I, how do I discern whether or not this is my one? Or my few? Like, how do I decide that? Okay, and so here's some practical handles that you can, that you can think about. Think about it this way. If you're going to do one, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone, consider going deep instead of wide. This is the only way you're going to be able to do this. In other words, go deep with just a few in your relationship with them. Get to know them. Spend time with them. Invest in them. You can't do that for everybody. If your net is to be really wide and that's your goal is to like, you know, change as many lives at, one, at, you know, at the same time as possible, you're probably not going to get to know anybody very well. And that's easy to do. It's easy to fall into that trap because it feels like we're doing more as long as we're touching more lives. When the truth is it could be, I mean, you've got to start asking yourself this question. Could it be, could it be, that you can make a greater impact in one life or a few lives or a few organizations by going deep into that relationship versus trying to spread yourself thin. Okay? It's worth considering. Then, it's, it's not, that's not it. Go deep instead of wide, and then think long-term instead of short-term. This is a season of life. This is like, this isn't just a you know, one and done. And, may, and maybe that was the, the one thing that, that would have been a little off about giving some clothes, even though in that scenario, I would say, you know, if you feel led to, give some clothes. But it may mean that there's something in you that wants to do a little bit more right at home. Maybe there's more I can do right around me. Am I, am I missing something? Maybe this is God's way of kind of nudging me and saying, this is an opportunity. I, I need to be doing something more for somebody. And when, and, and when you do that, this isn't just like a, a quick fix. This is like, I'm thinking in terms of, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to get to know them. I'm going to go deep. And then I, and, and I'm just, I just know that this could be a season for me. 
whatever that means, a season of life. Like this is like for this season, maybe it's indefinite, maybe there is a time frame, maybe it's, maybe it's for life with certain organizations. There, there are some organizations that we've been partnered with here at Ridge Church since the inception of Ridge Church from the very beginning. We have gone and done life with them. We know their names. We have, we have watched their ups and downs. We have given to them consistently and regularly, and we have served alongside them in this community. I mean, we've been with them a long time because we take this very seriously. And then the last one, th- this is important. Invest time, not just money. And you know how this works. I mean, if you're going to invest somewhere in, in something or somebody, if there's a problem, if there's an issue, if there's something that you can do and you want to be a part of it, you already know it's probably going to require a financial investment. But don't let it just be a check that you write. Think in terms of investing your time as well. Because a lot of times, I mean, yeah, I, I get it. It doesn't mean that the checks don't matter, okay? I mean, praise God that there are faithful, steadfast, you know, just kind of steady plotters here at Ridge Church that continue to give faithfully and we're able to serve and keep the lights on, okay? Praise God for that. But at the same time, there's got to be an investment of your time as well for you to really apply this principle, to do for that one or that few what you wish you could do for everyone. Think time, like this is going to be a big time investment, It's not just, hey, instead of me coming to that banquet, can I just write a check? You know, instead of me actually coming and serving, can I just can I just write you a check? I don't really want to go on the mission trip. Can I just send somebody? And all of those, like those, I'm not downing any of that, but I'm saying at some point for you to apply this principle in some way. You know, maybe those are kind of some of the extras for you, but maybe in some way there's there's a person, a family a group of people, an organization that you are heavily invested in. And I'm just saying it's not just about a money financial investment. It is a time investment. That's how you build trust. That's how you build relationship over the long term. So this is something um, that we started uh, a long time ago. This was our approach with our missions and outreach uh, strategy here at Ridge Church. This is it. I'm telling you from the very beginning of Ridge Church, It was do for one what you wish you could do for everyone because I knew that we probably weren't going to be like this monster large church with endless resources. And I I mean, guess what? I was right. (laughs) Here we are. And so I didn't want to spread ourselves so thin just for the sake of saying, look at all these things we do. I mean, there's plenty. I mean, let's. I've been a part of some of these churches, so I know that that it works this way. This isn't everybody, but there is a temptation to give a little bit to a lot of different places so that you can list all of those and show what all you do. Yeah, we support these 10 organizations in these 10 different countries, and, you know, we send them a 1000 bucks, you know, a year to these 10 different organizations, and then you put a map on the wall, and you got push pins that show all these places that you are, and you've got little, you know, yarn that wraps around. It's amazing, you know, and it looks so full. So my question that I wanted us to consider long before we ever actually got into that was what makes a greater difference? What, what has the potential to have a greater impact to give $1,000, and that's just arbitrary, just to, you know, an example, $1,000 to 10 different organizations in 10 different countries or $10,000 to one organization in one country where we're also, we also know their name and we're long-term with them and we're invested, and we're sending people and teams, and not just once in a while, but like multiple times a year, and we spend time with them, and we know their kids. And that has always been our approach, locally, nationally, and internationally. It's why we know the people in the DR so well, because we're just not in a lot of other places. Matter of fact, it's just the DR. And then our investment in Brazil now, through Christian Missions Unlimited, but really it's just our long-term relationship with the people there, and we have a bunch of people in the church who sponsor those kids, and we know them by name, and we know what their needs are, and we know their birthdays and their anniversaries. And it, it, we, we're family. It really is a, a home away from home for us, and that's because we chose to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. Now, individually, 
what, what we've chosen to do as a family, and again, this is what we do, and this was something I don't think, we, we never really discussed it. This wasn't like, you know, we wrote a contract when we got married and like this is how we're going to do life, but this has just kind of been as we've had time and as we've had opportunity and resources and the space in our home, we have always allowed people to live with us. Now, that's not for everybody. I get that. And some of you think we're crazy people. Because we've had at least, now, I, can, I honestly can't remember all the people who've lived with us over the last 10 years. Um, now, probably if I sat down and wrote them all down, but there have been at least two entire families with kids who have lived at our house. And not just like a couple of nights. We're talking for weeks and months at a time who've lived at our house because there was a need. There, there, whatever reason, that, you know, something came up. Now, was that every family that came along? No. But as we had time and as we had opportunity and God presented us with a situation, we said, now we can do for them what we wish we could do for everybody. And then when it came to fostering, now even adoption, adoption, we, we had adopted a, a little girl with Down syndrome from China seven years ago. And she's our daughter. You know, now there's a whole bunch more orphans out there in the world, but we did for one what we wished we could do for everyone. Now we haven't adopted any more since then. <laughs> there's a reason for that. But, you know, we went through foster classes and we haven't officially done fostering, but it's amazing the number of young people who have ended up living with us. Matter of fact, Pastor Jared, who leads our kids ministry now, lived with us when he moved down here before he started adulting, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> he lived with us for like eight months and he slept on a air mattress in our storage room, you know, and, but there was just something, it was like, and for us, it was like, this just, yeah, it was a no-brainer. There, there are two teenage boys who are living with us right now. One who, and I, you know, one who's been there for now, I don't know, five or six weeks, um, and then another, a, a friend of his, and, and it's just each situation is, is a little different. But there was a need there. It came to us. And we didn't set a time. We didn't say, well, yeah, okay, that's fine for the weekend. You know, I mean, I thought it. If I'm being honest, like I thought it, but you know what? I didn't want, I, I don't want to say I, I've grown weary. I'm tired because I have time and I have the opportunity to be able to do that. And some of you, if you think we're crazy, we are a little bit. And that's okay. Be crazy in your own way. And I just want to suggest, like, in what way is God leading you to be crazy? Because if you're a Christian, then as an individual Christian, no, it's not your responsibility to change the world. But it is your responsibility to change somebody's world. Period. That does not mean, it looks different for everybody. For some, it's adoption. For others, it's foster care. For others, it's working with homeless people. For others, it's working with those who have, you know, addictions. For some, it's, you know, with the marginalized or working in a nonprofit or organization. For some, it's leading a small group on a consistent basis. For some, it's serving here at Ridge Church because you've never done that. And it's like, I need to do that. And I'm going to do it consistently. I'm going to go time and I'm going to go money and I'm going to invest and I'm going to know people. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And what is the one? How is God leading you in this way? After all, this is what Jesus did. Jesus, okay, Jesus, God, Savior of the world. In his limited bodily form, in flesh, he also knew this principle was true, even of him that his time and his opportunities and his resources were limited. And yet Jesus, but, but he healed a bunch of people. That's true, he healed a bunch of people, but he didn't heal everybody. Jesus fed a lot of people, but he didn't feed everybody. Jesus taught a lot of people, but he didn't teach everybody. He spent time with a lot of people, but he didn't spend time with everybody. Matter of fact, he invested the vast bulk majority of his time with just 12 people. And then even more than that, with just three. Jesus modeled this. Je Jesus, and why, why, why do you think that we are about to celebrate 
with a third of the world's population, the birth of a Jewish carpenter who was killed on a Roman cross. Why do you think that is 2,000 years after the fact? Because Jesus invested himself, as he had time and opportunity, into the lives of a few who would turn right around and do the same. I think that's why. He knew the long-term impact of fully investing himself in just a few places with a few people as he had time and opportunity. That that's really what would make the biggest impact, the biggest difference. And the same is true for you and me. We can't disengage. We can't ignore it. We know better. But we can't do everything and fix everything. And so right in the middle is this idea, this principle of just, I'm going to, instead I'm going to do for one, but I wish I could do for everyone. And so I want you to consider, would you do that with me over the next few weeks? I mean, here we are, the holiday season, season of generosity and giving, and, you know, maybe it's giving to the Christmas offering. Maybe it's just beginning to tithe at church and giving in that way. I mean, that could be a new season for you. That could be the way God is nudging you. And it's kind of, you've just kind of been pushing. It's like, eh, I don't really want to do that. And yet, because, I mean, what difference does it really make? It makes a difference. Because it's long term. It's deep. It's an investment. It's one place. It's just a few places. It's not trying to spread yourself thin and give, you know, oh, 10 bucks here and 20 bucks here and four bucks here and six bucks here. Instead, I'm just going to, I'm going to pool my resources. And as I have time and opportunity and resources, I'm going to, I'm going to put it into one place. I'm just going to invest here with my time, everything I've got. Because that has the potential to make the biggest difference. doesn't mean you don't do some of the other stuff along the way. As you feel led, give some clothes away, give a little cash here and there. But, but you and I both know that God may be leading you, that there is something that either you've kind of pushed to the side or something that you've, you know, unintentionally or intentionally ignored for a while. What is it that is being presented to you that God is placing in front of you and you need to go all in, to really fully invest yourself with your time, your relationship, your attention, your resources, whatever it takes to make a difference. Never, never grow weary in doing good. Heavenly Father, my prayer for each one of us during this holiday season, during this Christmas season, is that we would pay, just pay attention. For some of us, maybe it's paying attention again. For others of us, maybe it's paying attention for the first time. But to what you are leading us to do. Of how we can invest what we do have to model that for our kids, to model that for our family, for our church, for the people around us, to reflect the love of Jesus to the people around us. Would you, would you just give us eyes and ears to hear it, to be willing to just be open to those gentle, subtle nudges for how you are leading us. But then, God, give us the courage, the courage to do it, to go all in, to, to alleviate the guilt of not doing anything, but then also the guilt of not being able to do everything. And instead, just to focus in on exactly what you would have us do, to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone, because that's what you did for us. We do this for you, for your glory. And now if you just keep your heads bowed for just a minute, for just a second, I want to speak to those of you who have never entered into that relationship with Jesus, because maybe, maybe for you, it's just like this is where it starts, is just to say, I need this, I need to, my, my, Time and opportunity is to invest into a relationship with Jesus. And that's where it starts for you. And I just want to give you that opportunity right now to step into that relationship. And I promise it's a decision you'll never, you'll never regret. And just right where you are, you can pray something simply like this. Just say, Heavenly Father, I know I need Jesus. I need a Savior. And I want to invest 
the rest of my life into that relationship. Because I am a, I'm a sinner. I'm a mess on my own. I recognize that. I confess it to you. And I invite you in. Fill me with your spirit. Change me from the inside out. I want to live my life for you, for your glory. In Jesus' name.